Thank you. Uh, opening the uh, January. Oh, I forgot the wrong agenda. Um, right here. Do you want? The January 17th um, meeting of the Muppet Roxbury Board of School Directors, opening at 634, 635. Um, and tonight, the first order of business is uh, public comment uh, because we had, well, first off, public comment. Um, is an excellent opportunity for the public to give feedback to the board. We do not respond in real time. Uh, that does not mean we're not listening. We take all the feedback very seriously. Uh, we oftentimes do respond in, in other ways or later. Uh, and we really appreciate the effort it takes to give public comment and also recognize that sometimes it can be tough to give public comment, uh, just given the nature of of speaking to a public panel in a public setting, and also you know some of the the matters you bring to us are sensitive and and emotional, and, and we really appreciate that. Also, uh, we uh, do accept comment by email. It's uh, schoolboard at uh, mpsvt.org, uh, which is another way both to give additional comment and if you are not comfortable uh, in front of a group. Uh, we will start with anyone in the room and then go to online. Uh, we have a slightly different process for online because um, at our last meeting, we had some people who used the open chat function to uh, do disruptive things. So um, when you open the public comment period, uh, uh, as usual, please introduce your public record. So. Attendees who use the raise hand feature to indicate they would like to speak. Um, so attendees online should use the raise hand feature to attend they want to indicate they want to speak. Um, and to do so, there is if you click over reactions, which is down at the bottom of the screen, uh, there's a little uh, raise hand function that pops up. Uh, if you're joined by calling in, you can raise your hand by dialing nine. Uh, and we'll notify you once you've raised your hand uh, that uh, it's your time to speak. Um, and you'll be prompted, uh, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself. But folks on the call will just not be able to speak at random by unmuting themselves. Um, and then also, uh, we will not have video. Uh, so it will be audio only. Um, so again, if you're speaking, uh, and would like to be on video, please say so at the start of your comment. Uh, and the host, I believe, can temporarily convert you to a panelist. But if that doesn't happen, you will be just audio uh, online. And um, yeah, sorry, this is more complicated than it has been. But again, it was abused last time. Uh, so uh, if anyone in the room wants to speak, uh, please just go ahead and um, come to the front and introduce yourself. Uh, Great. Um, do we have a do we have a second public comment? No, not today. Right. Ryan Zayda, Roxbury committee member. No, I just wanted to briefly say, I'm sure everybody knows for the last eight weeks, there have been a lot of conversations across the district, across the communities about all kinds of things. Conversations are great, communication is great, keep it up. I just want to acknowledge we've kind of been there before. We've been in big scary places in the past. We all lived through Act 46. We've all lived through this, we've all lived through that. And at the end of the day, this district has produced really good things for a lot of people all over the place. And as we're sitting here today in the uncertainty of Act 127, what's gonna happen with this? Where are we gonna go with that? I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm certain that this board and the communities and the district administration is gonna be able to come up with a solution that will at the end of the day still provide, excuse me, produce and provide those really positive things all across the community that all of our families, our community members have all become used to in our district. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, that we've been able to do a lot of good things and really hard times in the past. And I'm optimistic that we as a district, we as two communities can do the same going forward. So as always, thanks to the whole board for their community service. Everybody appreciates it. And, and yeah, we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. No, thank you, Ryan. Well said. Um, Anyone else in the room? Yeah, please come up. Hey guys, 
I haven't been here. I'm so sorry. It's my son's gymnastics meeting at the same time. I did try and talk a couple times. Jacqueline Frazier, my father's Thomas Frazier, who's a little more colorful. We have a home across the way, um, the greenhouse business, and I went to the school. So I'm a graduate of this elementary school and my kids are now half Ugandan and also attendees of this school. So at one point, this room was actually first through six and we divided it in the middle and we had first through three and four through six on the other. It was really chaotic. Um, and I, the snake got loose actually at one point and it was like all hell broke loose. And then the, the teacher, she like got it with her foot and like got the head and it was just like, just nuts. And that was during the um, expansion operation. So just as a Roxburyan, thank you so much. And we're here, we are here. We're just not always here. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, anyone else in the room? Uh, yes. Good evening, I'm Angela Bauer. Um, my kids also attended here. My daughter was in the first class. So I, I don't know why you said emotion. And I was like, no, this is not emotional. <laughs> this is serious. Um, but when I think about her transition into the big pond, it was emotional. And now I just see her thriving. So I just wanna thank you as a board for the hard work that you do. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have our kids in the bigger pond. They experience so many more opportunities. I feel like the quality of education they're getting in Montpelier is stellar. Um, I feel like the communication between their community and ours, while we do have our dips in certain areas, um, for the most part is really strong. Like, I praise you, Libby, so often as a teacher who's in a district where we don't have that strong communication from our, from our leadership. So I appreciate all that you're doing. And I think um, one of the awesome things that has come out of some of our conversations of late is seeing our Roxbury families come together and recognize so many of the good things. Like it's one thing for us to recognize what our Roxbury kids get from being a part of the Montpelier community, right? They have access to so many more opportunities than they would if they were just here, as my daughter puts it, under a rock. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's really cool to hear, <clears throat> excuse me, feedback from coaches and teachers and other families. Like, thank you for sharing your kids with us. Like, we are... Our peer groups are expanding because they have the opportunity to hang out with kids who've had a different elementary school experience. And that's been a really cool thing to be able to connect with families. Like part of it started out of necessity, like who can take my kid after school because I can't get there to pick them up. And at first that felt heavy, but now it feels like like an experience that has brought a lot of us together. They, we have grown friendships, I hang out with my kids' friends' parents now, which I didn't see when the merger was happening as being a benefit of that. So I really appreciate the coming together. I think it is a true benefit for the kids that grew up here and have their rural lifestyle, but are still now um, just opened up to new opportunities that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So thank you for that. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, please go up. Hi everyone, my name is Claire. I have lived uh, next door to this school for going on 47 years, and I can't imagine a better next door neighbor. Um, I have watched little kids like Jackie, graduates of this school, mature into lovely young parents. And um, you tell me what I need to do to keep the school intact, and I'll do it. Great, no, thank you. Anyone else in the room? And online, and you're probably going to have to. Um, so we have Lisa Burns. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, 
so I wanted to um, move away from the kind of Roxbury budget thing and into the academics that'll be presented here this evening. And I was very excited to see, as Ms. Bone Steele uh, noted in her letter, that her flywheel is turning faster on reading. So, and I'm sure there's many parents in the district who are happy to see that there's been some improvement in early literacy, which was extremely concerning. So hats off. Um, but I wanted to just briefly discuss math. Um, and Ms. Bone Steele also noted in her letter that that's problematic. But looking at the um, district's own data, uh, as it is right now, the graduating class, the data that you've presented, 36% of this year's class is proficient in the last reported uh, state math test, 36%. When prior to the pandemic, 56% of them had been proficient. And uh, when they started in the third grade, 74% of them were proficient. So we seriously have a problem um, with math. And as one of the pillars of learning in our school district is a timely intervention, I think we've gone long past timely intervention in math. And on the principle of every kid being able to do everything, it seems once they finish, every kid can do everything unless they need skills, math skills beyond the sixth grade level. So as um, we hear the data presentation, and I do understand as Ms. Bonesteel has been very patient to point out to me many times, the star Renaissance data cannot be used in any way to assess a whole class. She's informed me that uh, it's only for looking at each individual student, but nonetheless, I think the data is concerning and the other data, and I hope that some of you will ask questions because, as I said, a timely system to intervene is well past. 36% of graduates being proficient in math, not acceptable. The last um, state testing showed our average scores for uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders below sixth grade proficiency. Something has to be done. And I think you people need to start asking some questions and I'd very much appreciate it if you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else on? Nope. nope. Um, so we are on the agenda. Um, so consent agenda is next. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? second? Any discussion? I just want to encourage folks to read the superintendent's report because I really appreciated the, the energy that was coming out of that because of the improvements that the district is making. I recognize, of course, there's always more room to grow, but it was really nice to see such a positive note. Um, so now Mike Berry, at, oh, oh, we have a vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Now Mike Berry. Um, and thank you for putting this together. I know that we had uh, some last minute changes on the agenda and this was a little earlier than you had anticipated. So <laughs> we appreciate the fact that you probably had to do some some juggling to, to make this happen. So so thank you for being flexible and figuring that out. Thanks. Uh, we're actually, we're getting really good at our data work. We're, we're improving every time and and so it wasn't as difficult to put this together um, on short notice but uh, i'm gonna give kind of a broad overview on on things that we saw and things that we're doing well and things that we need to focus in on and then answer uh, uh, any questions that folks have um so one thing that we're seeing immediately is this response to our focus on literacy across the schools that's really a bunch of hard work by our teachers a bunch of hard work by our principals. Oh, thank you. That's amazing. 
I'm going to warn you that it's probably going to get really cold in here. So you yes. know, yeah. just know if people start putting on jackets, yeah, don't worry. Up a little. I can. I can. Yeah, I can. Is that, is that I, I think that's just collecting audio, but not amplifying my voice. No. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so we're seeing this response to our literacy work and the consistency that's coming with that. And we're hearing positive reports from our teachers. We're seeing students respond across the different settings. Um, and that's really wonderful. Um, and we're learning a lot as we go. And we're seeing that in the results in the data. We're seeing that in the results in the classroom. We're feeling really good about that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our data literacy is improving every day. We are getting better at finding metrics, identifying metrics, using them in conversations, having our collaborative teams, that's our grade level teams, our content teams, discuss data on a regular basis, our guiding coalitions, our leadership teams in schools, and even as an administrative team, we're spending much more time talking about data and responding to it um, in thoughtful and intuitive ways. It's really, it's really great. Um, our MTSS model is going through an iterative process where we're really developing what does our MTSS model look like? How do we respond to student needs at different levels? And our goal by the end of this year is to really articulate that in a clear way to our school population in school and out of school um, so that everybody knows how that system works. But we've learned a ton this year on all of that and tools like Panorama have really helped us along the way to, to do that. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. Um, our intervention systems are moving like lightning. It's been amazing. Our interventionists are very committed to working with our students in need um, and getting them the support they need to be able to access what's going on in the classroom. And we've got systems down. We've got people stepping into leadership roles. We've got all sorts of things happening in the intervention space, along with a new move towards collaboration with special educators. Um, so we're working with students in special education, as well as general education students in the intervention space and vice versa. And that is all new for everybody. And we're doing a really good job at exploring that and defining systems uh, to support kids. And that's been, that's been wonderful. Um, we're seeing scores go up in, in consistent ways. And we're looking at growth metrics with our eyes wide open. So we are now able to measure in different ways the rate at which students are growing and this is particularly important for our intervention students that may be multiple grade levels behind. We want to see them learning at a rate that's higher than average. Uh, they have more to learn in less time. And so now we have metrics to be able to do that to see if what we're doing in interventions in particular is working, and if it's not, to be able to adjust. So that, that's been really great focus for us. Um, and we're really proud of our interventionists across all the schools. Um, they're working extra hard as well as our special educators. Um, areas that we need to focus in on, uh, as mentioned before, we do need to look at math. The, the great news I have about looking at math is a couple things. One, we've learned a lot about how to look at things that aren't working and figure out how to identify what needs to change and move through, the, through those. So our educators and our administrators and our leaders are all pretty practiced at that. So this is going to be a very manageable look for us. The other thing I think, um, this is my opinion based on what I know about what's happening in classrooms and the data that we're seeing, is this is not an effort problem uh, on our part with mathematics. Our math educators are mo more motivated than anyone to dial in the system, and they're working really hard. I think what we have is some misalignment vertically. We have some things that are kind of out of order or not aligning between schools. And then we probably have a small amount of misprioritization. So for example, we may need to look at data and measurement at the elementary schools a little bit more than we have been. And, but now we have the data to really identify what it is um, and hone in on those things and, and fix them. Um, and we've also got a lot of successes in mathematics. We've seen some great strides between the transition from algebra one to the high school, the work that we're doing at the middle school, our interventionists in mathematics have been doing some great work. So we have some successes in there too. We do know that we need to find some alignment and tweak a few things um, and take a look at that. Um, we're still working to find data for different areas of content and how to make that meaningful. So for example, social studies, 
really important content area. Um, and ev this is something that a lot of schools in Vermont struggle with. How do we measure how we're doing in social studies instruction? And how do we inform our curriculum design around that? So we're looking into some things that we can do, um, some assessments and uh, data that we can pull based on standards and social studies. And, and that's one example, but that applies to other content areas as well um, beyond math and literacy. So we're still working on that. Um, we're still refining all of our systems. Um, and every day, I feel like we learn something new. I, I go to an interventionist meeting and they have seven new ideas about how we could improve our system and we start implementing them. And so we're getting really great at that process of identifying something that could be more efficient, putting it into place, implementing it, reflecting on it, and doing that. It has just become our fluid motion now. Um, and I think Libby's probably mentioned it before, our, our PLC structures are in high gear right now, um, from our leadership teams in schools to our content and collaborative teams and on down. It's, it's been great. Um, I think one of the things that we, we continue to need to focus on is the sustainability of it all. So our literacy work this year, the, the teachers deserve a big pat on the back. It's been a ton of work. Um, and they've really focused in on there. And, and especially at the elementary school where teachers are generalists, it's really hard to switch gears when we have this uh, big focus on literacy, which is amazing, and say, okay, now we got to talk about math for 15 minutes and we got to do this. So finding those sustainable ways to keep the conversation going has been key. That's where I think we're, we're doing the right work by focusing in on the PLC structures and getting collaborative teams to discuss things on a regular basis and having that internal leadership that we're getting from our, our educators is pretty amazing. Um, we continue to, to work on and refine the information that we have for the community about our curriculum and our curriculum work. So we are literally adding to the, the website weekly um, and really trying to increase our transparency on what's going on there, uh, whether it's in draft form or messy or whatever, we're trying to do a better job of getting that out there so that people are informed. Um, we have uh, redrafted, for example, we've redrafted our report cards uh, at the elementary school level and we've uh, drafted communications to families that have been looked at by parent groups uh, to get feedback, to see how can we better communicate via report cards or other reporting measures. Um, so we're really excited to get that going. Um, we're still working really hard to find the right data for the high school that's useful to the high school educators. Um, it, the high school kind of shifts once you get past ninth grade in terms of what information is really useful to classroom teachers in different content areas and to students depending on their goals and their focus. So we're really still working on that. And um, Jason Gingold, Emily Therian, and myself have been spending a lot of time discussing that, um, as well as our core team. Uh, we're still getting comfortable with Act 173 and special education and intervention folks. That's, that's a lot of kind of different systems learning to talk to each other in a fluid way. And it's, it's in some cases, it's a system that has never really been fluid before. And so now we're, we're working hard to try and figure that out in, in small ways. Um, but we've seen some successes, but we still have a long way to go on that one. Um, and then the, the last thing that we really, really need to focus in on is being able to articulate our MTSS structure clearly to the community, to our, our scholars and our, our teachers, so that everybody kind of understands how everything works. Right now, internally, we feel like we, we know it, but it's not articulated in one spot in a, in a clear way. So we're really working to do that um, by the end of this year. That's a big focus for our core team, uh, myself, Peggy Sue, and Jess and Nick. Um, we're spending a lot of time on that. And that's kind of my, my big overview. Sure. In a way that maybe somebody who's not as deeply enmeshed in education, what an interventionist does, like what sure. their role is. And <laughs> yeah, so we have um, teams of academic interventionists at each school, and those are uh, folks that focus in. Typically, they're they're in one content or another. Here at Roxbury, it goes into both, but um, they focus in on students that may be below grade level. Um, typically not students that are, are on an IEP for those supports. So these are general education students sometimes. 
Um, and they work with them on really focused, targeted skills in short cycles of three to six weeks, depending on which school you're in. And the idea is to focus on the goals in a linear fashion that move them towards where they need to be. So we have maps of skills that take them from A to Z. And if a student's at D, we're going to start with D and we're going to do E and we're going to do F and we're going to keep going in that process and moving them along on those skills that they may be lacking um, to access what's going on at grade level. Yeah. And we've got really smart interventionists. Like, I mean that. Uh, Vera. I'd be interested to hear more about what we're doing to bridge knowledge gaps at the high school level. Just anecdotally, I'm in an Algebra 2 class, and a lot of my classmates, I find it a little concerning, just like the real difference in levels people are at. Some folks can't solve basic algebra equations, um, and I know that a lot of that is caused by COVID, but um, I totally understand it's a lot more difficult at the high school level. I'm just curious what we're working on with that. Yeah, so th there's a couple things to that story. One piece of data that's really interesting to look at is we looked at students that moved into the district after third grade. And there's a really large amount of students that moved into the district after third grade. It's important to know that and to think about that. And that has changed how we address students moving into the district. So we screen students moving into the district early so that we can see what's going on. We look at their data from the previous school and really try to understand where they're at in terms of their exposure to pre-algebra skills leading up to the high school. So that's, that's an interesting piece of data that we're looking at and considering. One of the challenges in supporting students at the high school is the schedule. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. So at an elementary level or a middle school level, when a student enters an intervention, they go five days a week, 40 minutes for six weeks. At the high school, it depends on soul and block, green and white days, and if the student is assigned to the class and they're gonna get credit for it. So we, what we've struggled with at the high school in terms of intervention, and we're continuing to work on it, is um, time on, on intervention. So a student in, at the middle school in a six week intervention may have 30 days of intervention. A student at the high school may have eight in that time. And so how do, you, how do you move students that have a, a deficit in some foundational skills in eight days over six weeks? It's really difficult. So we're finding new ways to do that by looking at learning labs and looking at Solenblock differently and coming up with some course offerings that we can do where students are taking a course that essentially addresses those needs and those skills. So we're working on it. It's the schedule that really is, is challenging at the high school in terms of that support. The other thing that we're doing is we're trying to find ways to understand that data better. So if students have skills lacking in Algebra 2, what are those skills? Are they consistently the same skills that they're lacking? And where can we trace that back to? So the high school made a big shift this year to, to really focus in Algebra 1 uh, and students that come into ninth grade. Before, that was kind of spread between the middle school and the high school, and it wasn't very effective for either side. And so we've made a big shift this year that I think is going to make it a lot better. Uh, for students to be able to get all those pre-algebra skills at the middle school, be able to come into ninth grade confident and be placed appropriately. That's the other component. Um, there's a lot of pressure in mathematics to get to pre-calc. Um, and so that sometimes overrides what where a student really should be focusing on their skills when they get into high school. So there's a lot. That's a great question. There's a lot going on there. Um, and as I said before, our math educators are more motivated than anyone to dial all that in. Um, so we're actually, we're gonna be piloting a new assessment this spring um, that assesses all students in mathematics at the high school in algebra one skills so that we can see where those gaps line up no matter which mathematics class that they're in. Um, so that's uh, Tammy Beatty is kind of leading that charge. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna see what's going on. It's a great question. Ask me again in like two months. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Did you say my name? I can't. I didn't hear clearly. Um, yes. But I guess. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. 
Um, actually, something in Miriam's question made me think a little bit about some of the some of the data. And so, uh, I guess first off, I just want to say, as a scientist, I'm a big fan of of data and and try to interpret what I'm seeing. Um, and one of the things here, I'm flipping between screens, but one of the one of the pieces I saw. Oh yeah, so in the reading, um, running record, um, broken down by grade level. Um, I I'm wondering. The pattern that I'm seeing, if I do the math correctly, the 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 what grade three, those folks would have been maybe in kindergarten, the beginning of COVID. Um, and so I'm wondering if that if what we're seeing is there's a sort of lagging effect of COVID um, uh, disruptions in the way that uh, students were taught. And now, you know, the grade one level, they're, they're you know, up to 90 percent, which is awesome. Uh, and so I guess two part question is one, am I seeing that sort of <clears throat> that wave um, that that will be moving as the the students that were in kindergarten um, at the beginning of the COVID disruptions um, as they move forward? And then if so, what um, yeah, what can we as a district do to sort of backfill um, for those for those kids um, that were most impacted by um, by the disruptions? Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to say I'd I'd need more data to be certain that I could point to that as a causal relationship. Um, for example, I don't have in front of me the numbers for our multilingual students, which impacts this data um, significantly. Um, I don't have a sense of the cohort data from year to year. And the other thing I'd point out is just that this is the second time we've given this assessment ever. So it's it's still pretty young to us in terms of of being able to say you know this is spot on and what, what we're doing. I'm I'm not trying to throw excuses or anything. I, this this is the grade level that has the lowest um, proficiency on this assessment. However, I think um, I think there's some other factors for us to look at. Generally speaking, what we're seeing is students across all grade levels respond to our focus on literacy, and we do know that third grade is one of those pivotal years. Um, so when we look in the spring, it'll be interesting to see where this data is at and what we see. Thanks, Mike. I mean, can you explain <clears throat> between literacy and math? It seems like literacy is going well. Math, uh, you you identified a couple of problems. Like, how deep are those problems, and why? Yeah. Why do we seem to be having more success in one than the other? Uh, I, this is my opinion, and this is, so Amy Kimball and I are about to embark on a, a very extensive geeky journey in the next couple of weeks. Once she's out of the classroom at the middle school, we're going to do um, a pretty deep dive into what's going on in mathematics. And when I say that, I, I don't want it to sound like there's something drastically wrong going on. I don't believe that there is something drastically wrong going on. Our math educators, if you ever got them all in one room, these people want to hammer this out. Um, I really think that what we're looking at is some misalignment vertically between uh, elementary schools, the middle school, the middle school, and the high school. And the example that I used earlier is at the elementary school, we've backed off of measurement and data, um, mainly because of research at the time told us this is what we should be focusing on. And uh, several years ago, we, we were seeing great math results on the SBAC assessment. Um, then we switched assessments. And so we're, we have a new assessment that told us, you know, hey, your scores are a little lower here in mathematics than they were on the SBAC. We don't know how to compare that yet. Well, there is a study underway that the state's doing to say a crosswalk between the SBAC and the PT cap. We haven't seen that yet. So I, I can't really, I can't really say. Um, I do, I do think we're going to see some things in our, our research about, um, order of concepts and skills introduction at different levels, what makes sense and what we're doing. I think that, that, that that's something. And in curriculum land, that's kind of an easy fix. That's not, you know, we're not throwing out everything and everyone has to go to three years of training and like, no, we're just going to move single digit over here and we're going to move decimals over here. You know, that that's, that's a thing. I think we're also seeing, um, the need for more consistency and resources for mathematics for our educators. 
Um, so we do a lot of tight and loose, and I know Libby's talked to the board about that before as well, that we focus in on prioritized standards and proficiency scales, and we allow uh, a lot of uh, flexibility for educators to use their expertise to address those priority standards and proficiency scales. And within that, I think more consistent resources within mathematics in particular could be a real benefit across our schools. Um, so those are the types of things that I'm speculating. The great news for us, I think, is that we have gotten so much better at data use and collection that instead of wondering and working on assumptions and opinions, we're going to be really able to point to these are the three things that we need to talk about in three through five. These are the three things we need to talk about in seven through nine. And then a follow-up question. I mean, yeah, we're about to approve a budget or during a budget cycle where we are probably not going to be able to make the you know, major investments. Do you think without making major investments, we can significantly improve particularly the math? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we have those PLCs rolling the way we do, particularly at K-8, um, that makes that work so much easier and doesn't cost a penny because teachers are yeah. learning how to collaborate, not just work in the same room together, but actually collaborate and make that, make each other better teachers by studying the expectations, studying the teaching practices, seeing what's worked, what hasn't worked, and being okay to talk about that with each other. So none of that costs anything. That's a scheduling, that's a technical problem, right? So um, that is a piece that we're getting it go. We've gotten it going, K-8 in literacy, Yep. To the point where teachers are hungry for the data, they're loving the conversations with each other. They're just, they're excited about the work they're doing in the literacy world. So we want them to own that so they don't lose it. <laughs> and then we want them to have those conversations in math. The other thing that we got on our side is that we're, we're coming off of several years of high quality math professional development. We had our elementary okay. folks working with Christian Cordemach for at least three years, and that work still is there and present, and we can pull on that. And then we, our middle school and high school folks were working with the Teachers Development Group, which is a fantastic group that focuses on math instructional strategies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amy Kimball is our, our third ace in our pocket. Um, she's a fantastic instructional coach in mathematics. And she um, can really help us to do this and, and to get deorganized and to support teachers in it. Um, and she's already on staff, so that's not a new cost. So much so the teachers development group has tried to stole the stealer. Yeah, they're trying. <laughs> they're trying, not successfully. Um, just a quick follow up. Mike, would you say that the, one thing I just heard you say is like you you're about to go, or maybe I misheard this, but about to go from sort of like guessing and assumptions to being able to use like mm -hmm. point at real data. Would you say you'll be there by June, by the next oh, year? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, you'll I'm, have a little bit more of like- I'm just waiting for my partner in crime to get out of the classroom. Yeah. <laughs> so Amy Kimball has been teaching math at the middle school for the first half of the year. And once she's in the next two weeks, she's going to transition out of there and back to the, the coaching role. And then we'll We'll close the doors and get out the whiteboards and, and go nuts. Good. Yeah. Chris? I think Rob is the one. Oh, sorry. When you say resources for math teachers, can you provide an example what that looks like if it's not uh, something that comes out of the budget or yeah. something that's already? So there's a there's a really um, well researched and highly rated um, open source math resource called Open Up. Um, it's used at the middle school, and it provides um, structure to conversations in mathematics. So it's not necessarily um, do this on this day. It's more like, oh, we're going to be talking about decimals and fractions today. Here's some activities to get the most yield out of students in terms of that conversation. And what happens when teachers are using a consistent resource for that, students aren't seeing different uh, approaches to that or different imagery or different visuals to all of those things, they get some consistent experience across grade levels in classrooms. And that's where you see some traction starting to happen. So that's an example of something that we could look at for other schools, um, or even just organizing and calibrating around the resources that we do have already uh, can go a really long way. Calibration amongst teachers is, is a really effective tool in improving instruction. 
kind of happening when it comes to literacy instruction because that's been a little bit more prioritized and it potentially that process will could fold over yes but that goes back to the sustainability thing so right now our elementary educators spend one day a week receiving letters training and that's during their staff meeting time um, everything else that we're doing right now we kind of squeak in in different places so you know you, you, we don't have a lot of time with our educators to do big shifts so that's where we lean on the plc structure where we have our collaborative teams that are now being led by teacher leaders that can really take these conversations and make sure that they're happening in different places so it's just a little different approach so i wouldn't want the board to expect to see okay you know in january we're going to take a break from letters and literacy we're going to focus on math that's not how it's going to happen it's going to be more integrated into the work that we're doing um, but i think uh, to libby's point earlier our folks are really practiced at this right now and they're really comfortable with these conversations in a way that we haven't been before so it's it's not like starting from scratch yeah no. No, I'm saying, I think this is a good piggyback question actually to what you're talking about right now, because it sounds like what happens because of, you know, how the, the approach to elementary education is that they're generalists, I think is what I, the term that I heard you use. So is there any sensibility in, in terms of model that you go to more specialists versus generalists? Because it sounds like there has to be a lot of changing of gears. There's like this focus, heavy focus on literacy, yeah. and there's a lot of training up that needs to happen and kind of acclimating to that. And then... And then we can kind of fall behind in math a little bit. So is there any, because there's such a hyper focus on the literacy pieces or in elementary education theory, I guess, you know, is there any sensibility to shifting to kind of more of a specialist model? I got this one. Okay. <laughs> so Mike can disagree with me. Or yes, there is. Some school districts do do that. Uh -huh. um, and what suffers is social emotional learning. So at the elementary yes. level, the teacher is yeah. still a parent figure for yeah. kids in a, in a large capacity, right? Not quite a parent, but you know what I mean? It's a major caregiver in their life. Yep. And the and connection, yeah, <laughs> you see a called mm -hmm. mom constantly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that connection suffers when they move from one yeah. classroom to another classroom to another classroom or a teacher moves from one classroom to another classroom to another classroom uh -huh. uh, that relationship suffers yeah. uh, so i personally don't believe that you get the benefit um when you you get the benefit when you're losing that that connection i think that connection is way too important for our littles mm -hmm. And that's my opinion, but there's also it's it's it's, it's shown in different research. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Would you add to that? A little known fact: when I was the principal at Underhill Central School, uh, like a decade ago, um, we did that. We moved to a specialist model, uh -huh. and it was that ex exact experience. The teachers said they did some of their best teaching by focusing in on one content area. Yeah. But our students and families really. Um, struggled with that and you know it made parent conferences a whole different thing um, so it it has its challenges for sure um, but I'm also you know I'm I'm very optimistic about this I because we're going to be able to be so specific and not to uh, generalize about math educators but they're they're pretty fact-based mm -hmm. like show me the data and we'll fix it um, so there's, there's not a whole lot of um, I don't know, coercion to, to, to get things going. I, I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to lay this out in a plan that, that is very specific, that um, makes sense to everybody because it's based on data and um, be able to measure some change. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. You're optimistic about the rate of change, basically, in terms of being able to do that quickly. I think, you know, we yeah. think and talk about how like every day counts, right, for yeah. every kid. And, you know, when a year goes by and there's, um, you know, we're not at the level that we're at, like that is significant. So I am curious yeah. about sort of the rate of change. So when, when we can anticipate, you know, when our kids can really start to bump up in that in that content area. Well, I, I think I'm confident about it because I'm seeing it already. So today alone, I had three conversations with math teachers that were tracking data and trying to figure out what was going on and talking to other people in other schools. So we're already making change 
what Amy and I are going to attempt to do is to organize it so that everybody's on the same page about that change. Mm -hmm and that there's a systematic way that, that we're looking at it and measuring the impact of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm not hedging my bets, but I really anticipate that this is gonna be four to five key shifts mm -hmm. in K through 12 mm -hmm. that, that involve prioritizing something we may not be prioritizing as much as we should right now, mm -hmm. identifying common resources and organizing them, which is, that's Amy and I can do that all day long. And then um, potentially some gaps in vertical alignment. Mm -hmm. I'd add to the resource piece, I'd add to ensure that the, the rigor of the questions that our teachers yeah. are using are matching the rigor of the, of the proficiency scale and the priority standard, right? So mm -hmm. um, just making sure those are in alignment, but that's a resource question. Yeah. Can yeah. you give us an example of what that looks like, Libby? Sure. So. Um, it's very different for a, a kid to get a, a pure addition problem with just the numbers, right? Versus those numbers in a context where they're doing the same skill, mm -hmm. right? But it's very different to have to a read word a word problem, problem mm -hmm. right? And um, an add versus just seeing two notes, three plus four equals seven, mm -hmm. right? It's very different to see those, see a word problem and have numbers they don't need to figure out what they need. You uh -huh. know what I mean? Like you can uh -huh. see how the rigor can increase. Uh -huh. And so if one teacher's second grade classroom, I just use second grade as an example because I was a second grade teacher. If one teacher is only using the procedural adding, mm -hmm. right? The next teacher is only using a simple word problem. And then the next teacher is using a combination of all three um, where their critical thinking skills is in there a little yeah. bit more. Yeah then that third classroom most likely is going to have kids who who come out with a different skill level. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. So I think what I hear you saying is you want to raise the level of rigor to the third classroom level in all classrooms. I want to make sure all of our teachers on the second grade PLC, yeah. I know I just pick on them because I was there with them. Um, our second grade PLC are all understanding what proficiency means yeah. and what that looks like in an assessment item. Yeah. So that they're all, it's apples to apples that they're comparing. Mm -hmm. um, so when they're writing those common formative assessments, it's where it's where the expectation of the standard is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kristen? I'm curious to what extent you feel like we're like recreating the wheel, like, you know, having a limited understanding of assessment, I mean, it, it's a it's a lot of work. You've already just like like built all these systems from ground up. You know, we had the significant COVID blip where you were playing the role of a principal, which is you know no small detail. Um, and so we're moving along on these things. And um, I'm just and I, I I did take note as somebody as an environmental science you know major, we, we don't have assessments for science or for social studies, and so I'm kind of curious where are we with that? Um, and then just knowing kind of the time and resources and energy to kind of build up all these assessments. Um, like when would we see something there? Um, and I'm just curious, like in your role, how much do you um, like coordinate with other curriculum directors around the state? Or are we just sort of in our like MRPS silo because we have a really capable team and capable teachers. And so we're just sort of like blueprinting our own systems. Um, but do you like, you know, do you trade and borrow and learn from other curriculum directors to try to reduce your workload? <laughs> because it sounds really significant, <laughs> your workload. Yeah. Um, so we, we do have a science assessment. We have the VTCAP science assessment. So we're getting science data. It's just embargoed forever and a day. Um, yeah. Um, so we have science in social studies. What we're looking at is actually the the same group that puts out the um, VTCAP assessment. Cognia has these formative assessments in social studies. So our social studies folks on our curriculum committees are going to take a look at that to see if that's a viable option for us in terms of assessment. One thing I, I want to respond to. Um, when when you say you know when will we see these assessments there's different layers of assessments the the assessments that i'm reporting out on are super high level 
assessments. But right now, our, our teaching teams are creating common formative assessments that I'd argue might be more important to the grand scheme of things. So, and you and I will never see that data, data at, a, at a board meeting presentation. That's for the teacher to really inform their instruction the next day or the next week or those things. So right now, our teachers are going through that creating formative assessment after formative assessment after formative assessment. And so we've got tons of assessments happening right now. Um, and we're piloting other things um, as they go. I do think social studies is a tricky one and nobody, I'm, I'm not saying this as an issue, but nobody in the States really hammered this down. That's That's been a constant moving target for a long time for curriculum directors in particular. Um, as far as collaborating with curriculum directors, it, um, I don't know how to describe it. Cur curriculum directors are kind of like a tribe um, and, and we share everything. Uh -huh everything. So I meet with a regional group uh, every other week. Um, so we have the Winooski Valley Curriculum Leaders Group that meets, um, it's probably about seven or eight of us and we collaborate on everything. We share information that we're getting and receiving from the AOE. We share programs and resources that we have. Um, you know, Jen Miller Arsenal is the uh, curriculum director in the U32 district and I communicate with her constantly because I think she's brilliant. Um, and so we're always sharing everything. Um, and even before that, Libby and I were both members of a curriculum director group up in uh, the Champlain Valley. And it was probably the most important meeting we had every month um, was to go to that meeting and be able to collaborate. And I still talk to those folks too. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. Great to hear you're not alone. No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. No. The other thing to think about too is that's something that Jason and I actually were just talking about the other day is uh, for our MTSS work, Essex Westford <laughs> is very similar to us in the work that they're doing and the beliefs around and their MTSS model. So um, I'm quite good friends with their superintendent, and we have been talking for a while about how to get our administrators and our teacher leaders together so that we can go observe other schools in action and see how their PLCs are working and see how they're starting to get our principals talking of like, how did you solve this problem? Um, so that's another piece to this too, is, is finding the systems that are most aligned to us and, and talking and, and seeing if we can get in the same room together so we can talk shop. Yeah. Um, for those who are watching and might not be familiar, MTSS. Multi-support. Multi Look at this guy over here, huh? Jim, He's been fortunate Jim's for a been while. listening. Good job, Jim. You're listening. And multi-tiered system of support might not mean that much to anyone else. So it's essentially like how we ensure that the education is getting through to kids. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to say thank you again for not only for a, another robust um, data report, but also all of the work that's gone into the growth that we've seen so far. Um, so really appreciate that. And I have a few questions that are a little bit just to help me keep learning to understand what we're reading when we read these um, data reports. Um, the local assessment section is organized, or I guess we're, we, you're sharing this mean proficiency. Can you tell us what it means, what a mean proficiency means? It's going to be the average right. that students did. So for example, kindergarten fall forward counting to 100, the average was 67% proficient. OK, so 67% so of kindergartners in the fall yep. were proficient. Yep. And then in the winter, 114%? Uh, no. That can't be. Um, so no, that was a really good trick. Yeah, no, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the mean score from our system VCAT. So this takes the mean score for all of the scores on the assessment. And I don't have it in front of me on what the, the top amount is. Okay, so it's not, it's not like on the report card, no. one through four. No. Okay. One of the challenges with these assessments, um, I was looking at this with Rachel Whalen, um, Different students take different parts of this in the fall and the winter. Uh -huh. And it's it's similar um, with putting the uh, math foundational skills assessment, the, the back pages. Yeah. So the, what's tricky with those assessments, so in the fall on the, the math assessments, for example, let's say that there's a question that has two-digit addition and subtraction. 
in the fall, it has two digits. In the winter, it may have three or a decimal. And so the rigor increases, but those assessments are used for classroom teachers to change their instruction uh -huh. versus designed for a once a year proficiency, how mm -hmm. are we doing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and that's the same with those kindergarten assessments. I included them on here to show that we, we do something different for our, our youngest learners mm -hmm. um, in terms of assessment. Like they don't take Friendstar right out of the gate. They don't, you know, so we do a lot different at the kindergarten level and that's mm -hmm. why they're included in there. Um, but I can get some more information from Rachel on how that's all. Yeah, too. I think the thing that would be helpful to know is what are we aiming for? Mm -hmm. Is it, and I, I don't think this is correct, but where my brain went, because to me, it looks like the, the one to four score that would show up on a report card. I was like, oh, by the spring assessment or just spring data report, we'd want to see the mean be three because we'd want generally the kids to be where they they should be at the you know for their grade level but it sounds like you're saying that's not how to interpret what i'm looking at here no i think what, what we want to look at here is are the students growing is there growth from the fall right. to the winter okay the power in these assessments is at the individual student level yeah. so when a classroom okay. teacher is looking at how joey did right. on the, the letter id or the the counting that's what's really valuable about yep. it yeah, and I get that because we don't have the information from the basically like the one standard that is the once a year yeah. students take it to determine proficiency. I really appreciate that you're sharing all these other little pieces with us. It's just hard to get what the big picture is yep. from all of it. Um, and one of the... Um, one of the things that I think would be helpful to bring in every time we get a data report is that we have our newly set by the board academic priority of closing the gap. Mm -hmm. And you know the gap being the one that has historically existed between more privileged students and less privileged students due to racial and socioeconomic factors. Um, because none of this data is disaggregated, which I can understand at the kindergarten level, you can't tell mm -hmm. us. Um, it's hard to know if we're making any progress on closing the gap. And so far, I don't think we've actually determined what our gap is currently. Correct. So is there something that we can start to see at the board level about this? Yes, there is. Um, so we, I have here, you can't see it because it's embargoed, um, <laughs> but we took the VT cap data and uh, created a visualization system for us to be able to see the graph, uh, see the achievement gap. And I'd argue that there's actually maybe 12 different achievement gaps. Sure. So what I have here is I have um, ELA math and science broken down by economically disadvantaged and not economically disadvantaged. And I have a line graph and a bar graph, but the line graph allows us to see where there's huge gaps yep. and then where there's not. Mm -hmm. And we can overlay that from year to year to see if we're bringing those lines closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, informally, what I can tell you is that, uh, so in socioeconomic land, there is not a significant gap between um, an ELA and math. Science, yes, mm -hmm. which was really interesting. And then I um, did an achievement gap by gender. Um, so we have female, male, and non-binary. And there was a, a larger gap in ELA than math, and then another uh, large gap in science. Um, then I did IEP status and also race and ethnicity. And I want to go back and I want to add chronic absenteeism, our SEL data, and multilingual. Mm -hmm. So we will have, once the embargo is lifted, I feel like it's some great historical event, but yeah. um, we will have a metric to discuss the achievement gap for the first time, which I think is really viable yeah. and a way for us to really see if we are addressing the achievement gaps that we've identified. Yep. So we, we've got it ready to go. There's Thank that you for telling us you can to... tell us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on that embargo, do you think it has anything to do with, you were just saying they're doing a study to see if they can compare apples, make it apples to apples, the SBAC to the VT cap. You don't think it has anything to do with that? All right. No. Hopeful thinking, I guess. <laughs> no. We got an update recently that said that they were hoping for February 1st. And just to prepare everyone, Libby and I know how this will happen. 
uh, it'll be a Friday afternoon at four and there'll be a press release. Well, Matt Digger will know before we do. Yep. And then, and then we'll have a chance to, to rally on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. that's, but yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful February 1st to be it. Yeah. <coughs> One other sort of request, because we have, now that the board's come up with the indicators, we have two indicators that we came up with in the academic, closing the academic gap, which are about establishing a baseline and seeing a pattern of growth across demographics for students in grades eight to 12, self-reporting their own confidence in their academic skills. And then another indicator of seeing a pattern of growth in 11th and 12th graders about reporting high levels of confidence in what life looks like beyond um, school, because school, mm -hmm. they're about to graduate. Um, is that something that you can start to share with us because you're gathering that through Panorama already, or have you not started getting that information yet? That would be a good Jess Murray and, and okay. Nick question, I think. It's more in the survey land. Okay. Um, I'm imagining that's how we would collect that data is um, through student surveys. Um, that's something that we can discuss for sure. I think that's very easy for us to work in the Panorama. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Other questions or comments? I have a question about, you were talking about special education and interventionists and that's sort of a work in progress. Is it expected to look like it does for like wind block or whichever block? Um, so um, like what that? I was referencing was Act 173 that allows um, for lack of a, better terminology, the mixing of special educators and interventionists. So we have some academic interventionists who are delivering IEP services because they're the most qualified to do that. And Act 173 allows us to do the same thing where special educators could provide intervention to non-IEP students. And so the idea is that this flexibility um, gives us twice as many people to address student needs and not in silos. Um, but it, it, it has been tricky because those two worlds were very separate for a long time. You went to intervention and if that wasn't working, then we went to, you know, IEP land. And now we're, we're rocking that a little bit and, and we're saying, no, let's just put everybody in the same room, all the special education interventionists and say, here are our kids. Who's the best person to work with these kids? And so we're trying to get to that land right now. We have to do with 173 show if a, if a student, if we're questioning, if anybody's questioning whether or not a student has a learning disability or not, by law now we have to show that we have had an effective MTSS model wrapped around the student. Um, and so that, that forces basically our educators to talk to each other in a different way. Are there um, professional learning collaborations or Communities. Communities. Are there PLCs for special educators? Yep. And Peggy Sue's working on that piece. Um, she's going to come at a later date. Um, so it would be a great question for Peggy Sue. Okay. You know, she spent her first year getting us out of, um, yeah. or getting us back on track with um, our policies and procedures around special education. And she's been moving into um, really really focusing in on families and IEPs and ensuring that everybody's experience is similar with that process. She's in a lot of IEP meetings right now and building the um, capacity of our special educators in that realm. And she, she is still part of all the conversations that we have as a core team around these system things that Mike, are, Mike is talking about and she'll be able to continue to move in more. But that's her goal is to get special, ed you know, we're working on our academics working within the same model, our SEL working in the same model. Nick presented to the lead team today about chronic absenteeism within the same MTSS hmm. model. And special education will, will also start to function in that way. So, so it's just the way we do business. Mm -hmm. um, I had one more thing. Referring back to the flywheel analogy. Um, once the flywheel is spinning, can it become more cost effective? Mm. It could. It yeah, could. it becomes sort of self-sustaining. 
this is the way this community works. New person comes in, they get sucked mm -hmm. into that way of working yes. because that's the way it's done. And potentially maybe coaches take on different roles or move on to different things or yes. whatever. Yes. Trying to say that as safely as I can because it's not <laughs> freak anybody out of breath. <laughs> Like Kristen, yeah, I have Kristen, a quick question. Uh, um, I have an RBS specific question. Um, it looked like we had some pretty big jumps in the RunStar assessment scores. Um, and I think the last time you were here, Mike, I had asked a question about Title I and, you know, was RBS or other schools in our district eligible for Title I? And the answer was Title I is sort of an enigma, but I remember Libby, you also saying like, it, it's not like a people thing. We don't need more people. We need like different systems. So I'm curious what you all think led to kind of those, those jumps at RBS. I think there was like an 18.2% increase for uh, reading Shannon proficiency Miller. while, Shannon while Shannon more Miller. students took the test. <laughs> yeah, too, well, exactly. And then there was a 20% increase in, in math. So I'm curious, you know, so there's Shannon Miller and then are there specific like systems? Yeah, Shannon Miller has brought in different systems and she is phenomenal Yep. here at RBS. Um, and she's a phenomenal educator mm -hmm. and she really, she lives and breathes these kids here and making sure that like she, her, her expectations are quite high. Um, and she's changing how the educators here talk about kids. She's changing how they think about kids. She's changing. She's rec she's getting them to recognize that what they do can change can impact the kids' learning. Mm -hmm. um, she's just she's fantastic. She was a fantastic hire, um, and she is ensuring that the systems are happening the way they're supposed to be happening. Um, I'm looking at Mike to see if he wants to add on, but I think Shannon's got a big thing, big reason for it. She no, was, she was fantastic hire. Absolutely, the, the leadership has been super helpful. I, I think the educators also have been working really hard. They they're, they're doing the letters training as well, mm -hmm. um, and so they're getting a really substantial boost of literacy, of professional learning on a weekly basis. Um, they're communicating between schools. We're supporting with new assessments and data. They're, they're administering that. They're looking at that. So everybody's doing a lot. Yeah. And they're, they're responding to the expectations that she's setting. So it's cool. It is. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Other questions or comments for Mike or Louis? No, well, thanks again. This is, has been super useful. And um, I just want to echo everyone to say, we appreciate all the work and we appreciate the data. This really helps us get a snapshot of, of where we're at and where we're going. Um, and, you know, education is, I know we talk a lot about other things like budgets, but education is, is why we're here and um, knowing where the kids are at. And this is in the other place is super helpful and really appreciate the work and the uh, presentation. Thank you. I think I just have a question for the board just yeah. in terms of like accountability to our own goals. And we have this document now and there's, you know, I think Libby built in sort of like yeah. a tracking section. So kind of like who's going to be responsible for inputting that information and kind of taking what we see here and inputting it into there. Do we have like a system for that? We don't. We don't have a system, but that's, uh, that's a great question. And um... And I will be honest that I, I just sent it to Jason with your comment around the high school just to remind us. And yeah. uh, and I was like, I've, I've forgotten a little bit about this with all the budget. Right. Yeah. 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 It so, feels like a nice yeah. No, I, I think that's a good yep. thing for us to focus on when we, we get through budget season is yep. you know, making sure that we are plugging this data into. Yeah. And I appreciated the questions, particularly from Mia around, um, you know, tying this back to our goals and goals. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we're on to... Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. On to our um, the board action for the budget. Uh, and while it's on my mind, before I forget, I just want to for board members and people of the public who haven't picked up seven days, there's a fantastic article in seven days about Joe Carroll's healthy masculinity class at the high school um, with several students quoted, but um, he's really, he's 
you know, Joe does fantastic work. He's one of our many excellent educators. Uh, but um, he put together a class, I think kind of coming out of the Me Too movement, um, where boys can get together and, and just talk about how to be uh, men in society that are are caring and loving and and healthy and uh, you know present masculinity in a in a positive positive light and and a, a loving caring light. So uh, I want to thank Joe for his his great work. And if you haven't read the article, it's um, online and at we're share your, all of our social media. Yeah, <laughs> at wherever you pick up seven days so um thank you joe and thanks to all the students who've participated and thanks to olivia and the leadership for making space in our schools for um teachers to to take those those risks and and those chances um so we are on to uh the fy 25 budget uh with the action of approving uh the proposed fy25 budget and warning and um i'm going to turn over to you libby for any update on uh, yeah we asked Chris, for Chris is on too so if anybody yeah. has any questions oh, good, she's on okay. the webinar um so some in the agenda you can see the new chart just we just have the chart for you there's no from our end there hasn't been considerable changes except for taking that uh additional money from the fund balance out however that was um that we got the healthcare new healthcare enrollment with the ending window was sometime in december and late december just or early january christina will know and so people you know some people switch from single to family to you know so that has budget implications and that's <laughs> finalized now that was one of the unknowns that was still being finalized so um, this is where we're at now. I will point you to the property dollar yield in the gray has decreased again already. Um, Jake and I were in the House Ways and Means Committee and we got the Education Fund Outlook and I whispered to Jake during the meeting, that's not the dollar yield I know. <laughs> he, he said, it's not the dollar yield I know either. <laughs> so let's hear what Julia Richter has to say. Um, so that has fallen already again um, to 9,171. That does not influence our budget because we are capped. The only influence the dollar yield can have on our budget is if it increases significantly. Mm -hmm. It is not going to do that. Um, so uh, it will fall precipitously. I will tell you just statewide that fall will, uh, you know, will impact students or um, students in districts that were not capped so that that is where that will have impact um i'd also like to say to the board that this was a really hard budget season and i have lived and breathed this for the past you know since october and just recently it's pretty much consumed all of my working day i've been working a lot with the vsa and vsba um, and as a trustee, as a member of the statewide trustee group, and uh, I'm really proud of this board and the work that you did in this budget year. That was very hard. Other boards are taking some different routes that um, I'm, I'm happy we're not in that situation. So I'm just really proud. If you read the VSBA um, outlook today, board members, I encourage you to do that. Um, it gives you a picture of what some other boards have decided to do that is not in the spirit of 127, um, I'd argue. And and so anyway, I just wanna say that you've done really good work and I'm proud to be uh, a colleague with you all through this budget season. Thanks Libby. Um, so anyway, this is our budget. It, it Again, it has not changed much from the last time we met other than including all the healthcare and taking out some of that fund, fund balance. Christina, would you like to add anything to that? No, we pretty much nailed it. <laughs> Great. So we're having to take any questions if you have questions. Yeah. yeah. I had a couple of questions on the language of the warning. Um, so we, the way that we have phrased it um, is the um, per long-term weighted average daily membership. 
Mm -hmm. um, which obviously because that language didn't exist before this year, it was not in previous um, budget warnings. And I'm just curious if there's any reason what the reason is to use that number rather than like um, we just use our, you know, general student population. Um, butts in seats, as you like yeah. to say. Is there, <laughs> so was there a reason? Yeah, I'll let Christina answer <laughs> okay. that. I know that last week, Christina is a member of an organization called um, VASBO, which is the business managers of the state. And last Friday was a tumultuous VASBO meeting, but they, as a group, talked about the warning language. Um, and I see Jake has his hand up too. So Jake might want to jump in there too. Christina, do you want to say anything about the warning language and why y'all decided to do the way you did? Um, well, I'd just say that because the new term is what we need to use, <clears throat> excuse me, and we can't use equalized pupils. So last year's warning said equalized pupils. So I just wanted it to be very clear of the new language. Okay, so this is the way essentially we phrased it last year. We just obviously didn't, we used equalized pupil not long. I just couldn't remember if we had used the, you know, like our actual student population, but we did use equalized people. Okay. That's the new lingo. Jake, do you want to add to that? Um, sort of, or sort of a curveball. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the curveball is that um, the language, we we don't need to include this language. Um, it, was the, it was suspended in Act 127 because you're going from equalized pupils to long-term with the ADM. So... Um, it doesn't have to be on the ballot this year and also for the next, uh, or maybe it's just this year, but it, it doesn't have to be on the ballot. So maybe people want it on the ballot, but um, it's not a legal requirement. No, you're right, Jake. It's suspended for the whole term of Act 127. I think that's what he means, Jill, but maybe, I don't know if he heard your question. Jake, do you mean the long-term weighted average piece? The yeah. last sentence of Article 3? No, that it's 9.5% uh, higher. Does any of that have to be on it? Starting with it, starting with it is um, estimated. Yeah, that that whole piece doesn't need to be on the ballot for voters. Just our total budget amount needs to be on there. Yeah, yeah. we went one step further just to explain it. And yeah. is that something that you all debated, Christina, in your meeting last Friday? Yeah, it was kind of all over the map. People are um, last year. Yeah, it was last year. It was also suspended. I think it was through Act 46 that it was a minimalist. It was just that first sentence, but we wanted to demonstrate to our taxpayers what their tax rate would be. So it was suspended last year and further suspended this year with 127. So again, everybody, every district is kind of doing it differently. So really it's a board's decision. Right, right. And Jake's throwing the curveball out that we could only have the one's first sentence there of article three yes that's correct christina i i missed what you just said what's the rationale for why we would include anything beyond um the question mark in article three sure i think it's just important to show for transparency purposes um to show exactly what we're we're proposing I um I agree. I think that so that that one thing um I think was like maybe the best part of Act 46. Mm -hmm. Uh honestly. Um it's a great transparency piece. Um, but I also understand why the legislature suspended it this year, because it's not apples to apples from from last year. Um and as a voter, you know, um voters might wonder like um you know 9.4 then this is getting big picture here but they might look at that they might say like 9.45 percent is a lot should it be that high if it was lower our taxes would be lower but we all know that that's not true right you know, so it's kind of a can of worms a little bit um but so so i i, I defer to you guys on what you think should be said there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see those last two sentences remain um, for a couple of reasons. One, we've done a lot of work from the very beginning 
of this budget season to be transparent with our communities about what we were facing. And it feels like if we didn't share this information now, it feels a little bit like we're shutting a door that we don't we don't even need to shut. You can find this information if you just look on our website. Um, it, it, you can find this information in this board budget packet. It's, it's sitting right here. Now, granted, you'd have to know how to read this spreadsheet, but <laughs> it is here. Um, so, you know, to me, it feels like a continuation of the transparency that we have been um, striving for throughout this whole process. Um, and then my other thought to contribute to this conversation is, um, the, I believe the sort of like political word on the street is that school budgets are actually increasing like 12% this year oh, or yeah. something like that. You know, that's the, some sort of talking point that's out there. This is lower than that. So people who are trying to stay informed might even look at this and say, oh, this is, you know, our district is trying, you know, with all of the, the pressures bearing down on us, trying to do the most responsible thing. So those are two thoughts I have in response to the idea of removing these two sentences. Joe, I just I wonder in that context if because this is 9.45% higher per long term weighted average daily membership. Is that is that apples to apples the 14573. And do we want to instead to your point? I mean, I thought our budget overall budget increase was not that so if that's how this is reading not the per people going up 9.45, but our budget, that's, that might I mean, actually be misleading. That's a concern too. I mean, if, if I, I mean, I know we've had some good followings here, but my guess is that of the 3000 people that are gonna vote on town meeting day, there's maybe 200 that are even close to understanding what this means. Yeah, that's um, generous. It's generous, maybe 20. <laughs> uh, and, and I think for the other, 2,990 or 980, it's gonna look like we're jacking our budget up on 10%. Mm -hmm. And which is, I mean, it's transparent, but it's in, in the context it's given, it's it's gonna give an impression that makes us look pretty, uh, look like we have, we're spending higher than we are. It sounds like Scott wanted to weigh in, but Scott. then I also have a response to that. But also Lynn, did you, it sounds like Lynn wanted to say something. Yeah, I think I, I think it was Jill who just said that um, I the the comparison between the different um, statistics that are being reported in the media, it, it's a little it's all over the place. And so if we are in Article three, we're talking about a budget of 32 million, I think the appropriate transparent number would be the increase year to year that is a number that people understand um i still don't i mean i guess i should understand what the long-term weighted average daily membership is but but yeah i i, I think it's I, I think it's our job to put put forward the 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 most clear information and a year over year budget increase is the most clear information in my opinion and that would be i don't know what what it's six percent or something like that i can't remember where it, what it is and sorry for the screaming in the background and, and it also doesn't talk about the the tax implication which is going to because a lot of people are going to see 9.5 percent higher and, and i think in people's minds they quickly go well, that's going to be a 9.5 percent tax increase too um, I don't Lynn know and add something additional to that that would indicate for in like you know the information that people really want to know, yeah. which is how much army tax is going up or what's the percentage of increase of the budget. Yeah, I mean that's I guess that's uh, when it comes to transparency. I'm not sure that those two lines do anything other than confuse and mislead people without extra context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add, I think it also, um, <clears throat> it puts the responsibility upon us to explain it, yes. you know, so I think we would have to think about our capacity, capability, forums, opportunities to, to be able to explain that to people, which I think it's all generally <laughs> figured out upstairs for us, but it's, it's tricky to communicate. But we have, which we have done in previous budget, um, yeah. leading into town meeting day as well, you know, written op-eds and help. Right public forums 
Yeah, which which will do again. Although the public forum shows on the beast, but I think op eds are yeah are good ways and the budget page as well. But also, like like honestly, the, uh, there's a good portion of people who 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 will will see this for the first time when they on town meeting day when they walk into the. And, and that's that is like the that is pretty different. much all the information they get. Yeah. Right. Is, is there a way? I know op eds is 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 a great avenue for trying to communicate, but is there a the a possibility that we could say something like as a result of Act 20, 127, the increase will be limited to five percent? Following this is a 9.4%, 9.5% increase, 9.45 percent increase. Because is that right, or am I saying that? Or am I wrong? Is this the number? This is the ten percent we are trying to stay under. This is yeah. the ten. Yes. 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 You're, so, not, you're right. I would. I'm is just that yeah, I'm confusion. Not, I'm just not sure. sure. That language is. Jake would know if that language is allowable because I I don't know that. Um, and I don't. I, it's just so complicated. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have Simple to follow that, that mean, conversation. Because like, if, if we're going to say this is uh, a 9.45% increase, I. Well, you have to further say that it's long term weighted average. Because if you look at the actual increase to the budget, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, it's okay. Um, the increase to the, uh, you can look at so many percentages down the. Are you still looking at the the spreadsheet? <laughs> so, so our yeah. general budget is up twelve percent, and then our ed spending is up eleven point six four percent. But the number that truly matters in this budget cycle is the ed spending per long term weighted average daily membership, which is the nine point four five. So there's there's a lot of different percentages that you can put out there. <laughs> you know, it's it's what the board wants to do. And then we can further talk about the tax rate um, for our community members where, you know, it's 19% for Montpelier and it's 8.445 for Roxbury. Which is because of the CLA's impact. Right. Right. So there's a lot of options. <laughs> Great, uh, Jake. Um, um, I'm not super familiar with this part of, um, you know, the ed finance picture, um, but, or, or the ballot language, but I think it's like kind of prescribed, like, isn't it, you can't just write a few paragraphs about whatever you want. Isn't it kind of, of like a formula of some kind? Well, they suspended everything and only required us to put in the, the budget amount. But could you add, could you say like, you know, we think that, that, you know, whatever act 127 is really terrible for us and blah, blah, blah. Can you just start talking? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That, that might go against the whole, I'm proud of this board. <laughs> we did that. You can only state, you know, the percentages and, and word it that way. You know, that the tax rate for Montpelier will increase by this amount and the tax rate for Roxbury will increase by this amount. So you have to use all the numbers in here. You can't just start talking about things. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I hear Rhett's comment. Um, I think it would be pretty complicated to start talking about the 5% because um, the 5% is on the equalized rate, which nobody even knows what it is basically. And the true, experience of taxpayers is what's going to be in that yellow column or orange-ish to the, all the way to the right, 19.19 um, for Montpelier and 8.45 for Roxbury. Um, and even then, you know, things are still like kind of uncertain. Um, uh, Montpelier or Roxbury could appeal their equalization study results, which would affect that. Um, or you know, maybe the legislature comes up with uh, two hundred million dollars to pump into the ed fund, and that that would change. So, what what goes on with taxes is not set in stone at this point, and it won't be even really set in stone for for March. Um, Which so. leads to a 
point, Jake, around just putting the total budget in. Because that's what happened this this for FY24 for Montpelier, because the the CLA went up so much. It was it was nothing. Like the number that we passed was not the number that you paid. And what's the I mean, could we I think But we Scott, didn't include the tax rate in the language last year, did we? I don't. Christina, do you know what our warning was last year? What we included? We debated this last year too. Yeah, we included the tax rate. Um, anything, any calculation after the yield is going to change. The yield always change changes in May. Yeah. So right, but because well, Libby just said that. Oh, I think if, we had estimated if, or something. If the yeah. yield, even if it goes down, it's not going to impact us because we're capped. Right. right. If it goes up, then it will impact us. Yeah. yeah, but we're the numbers that we're looking at right now on the spreadsheet are pretty solid for us as far as tax rate goes because of that 5% cap. Unless, unless Montpelier does what Jake says with the equalization study, right. contests it, uh -huh. or Roxbury does. Well, Roxbury hasn't been assessed, so it would just be Montpelier. Yeah. I think it's helpful um, to put out something straightforward to the public that most people who read the ballot can understand. And, um, you know, knowing that we have a reasonable percentage increase in our budget over the previous year, I think might be helpful for people to know. Yeah, I mean, I would feel more comfortable if it had, if we caveated this with to what exactly what Lynn said, which is what the actual budget increase is, not the, I mean, no one knows what a <laughs> long-term average then, daily membership so mean. Budget, I mean, a membership is, it doesn't even sound like a person. It does. So no, the budget like, increase definitely is 11.9. 11. Uh, right, so then you're putting a bigger number in. It's 11.9? Yeah. 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 Joe, what are you thinking about over there? Um, I mean, at least that's transparent. Yeah. I yes. think there is a reason why a lot of boards and administrators, I thought, thought to that this was very confusing required language that looks like it expires at some point. This piece about if approved, it will result in education spending of blah, 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 per equalized people is blah, blah, blah. Like, I think there was a reason why they suspended requiring to say that. So I, my, just my, my recommendation would be it go? that we only say the piece about the budget and I would support saying something about this projected spending or this represents an 11 point something percent increase in the total budget from the current year or something that's much more, like I, I think this is just confusing people. Well, that, that could be estimated that increase too, I would, and, and say estimated, because the estimated tax increase is not 11%. It's 19. It's, I know it's, <laughs> it's, 19. it's 19 total, but capped at five, right? No, no. it's 19, 19. Yeah, right. because of the CLA. CLA. Because of the CLA, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Jake, what did you want to say? Why should, we should put that in there. <laughs> if we're, if we're going to talk about, so the general budget in, in, in the first sentence of Article 3 is 32046. And so if we were going to talk about how that compares to the current year, um, which we don't have to, but that would be 28608, and that's an increase of 12.02%. Um, that would be extra information. You could provide it, but the, if you want to do apples to apples, you would you would do total budget for FY25 compared to total budget for FY24, if that makes sense. It is it the does. most straightforward way. You so, said yeah. it much more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, say that again. It... Um, well, Jill was Jill was saying saying it's an increase of 11.9%, but that's a different number. Um, and sorry, I'm, I'm, I should correct my own terminology here. The number in, in Article 3, we're talking about the general budget. That's the number that we have to warn, is my understanding of 32046. So if we're going to talk about an increase from the prior year, it would be the general mm -hmm. budget from FY24 is 28608. So we're, we're proposing an increase of 12.02%. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Last year, just for the board, Anna got grabbed the 
FY23 or the FY24 warning mm -hmm. for the board's knowledge. So last year, Article 3 read, shall the voters of the school district adopt the budget of 28, whatever, which is the amount of the school board is determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of 19,670 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is a 9.05% higher than spending for the current year. So you did. So that's what we have yeah. this year. You have the same thing this with just this year's numbers. What was proposed was the same thing except with long-term weighted average, mm -hmm. average daily membership. So, so last year we did not include estimated tax rate. No. Or tax rate increase. No. Mm -hmm. Or the increase from the year-to-year -year budget. Right. I stand with Lynn in terms of just like the simplicity piece. I think the add-on of that 14,000, nine point, I think, I think that washes over most people. Um, and it feels like what's most important, you know, and I realize that that is the, the highest number is actually in terms of a percentage increase is the general budget number. Cause that's at 12%. Actually, the, the highest number is the Montpelier tax rate increase. Yes. <laughs> Trying, trying to avoid that, but yes. So, but but like you said, I mean, right? That's likely not going to change because of the cap, and so. But either way, we're going to have some explaining to do. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, a nine percent, ten percent, twelve percent. Like, I mean, that's you know, especially if we're talking about there was nine percent last year. It's an additional X percentage. You know, this year. Um, you know, either way, you know, it's going to require an explanation which is what we do every year, you know, you just hope that people, you know, actually read and understand, you know, the op-ed, but I also wonder, so, and I'm sorry, what was the total, we didn't have the total budget increase from last year, is that right? Not, uh, okay, not, uh, no. just Correct. curious how general it compared, budget, yeah, budget, right. Go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I'm perfectly fine with having it be the, um, this represents an increase of 12%, basically the general budget increase instead of the, um, the way it's written right now, I just think since we've written it this way in the past, the way it's written now, it does make sense to me to, I don't feel all that strongly, but I think it does make sense to me to keep it. Um, I think the one thing that we had going in our favor last year with the way this was written is it at least the word pupil was in there. So you could um, translate it to whatever 13 or 12 or whatever 13,000 per pupil, but now with long-term weighted average daily membership, that <laughs> that, that understanding I can see uh, being lost in the shuffle. Um, and I just want to say, you know, right now we're like wordsmithing the language of the um, warning or the ballot itself. And in the, at the end of the day, we as a board have worked very hard and our administration has worked very hard to craft a budget that we're actually quite proud of. And so it won't be that hard for me to go to the people that I know in my community and say, please vote yes on this budget, no matter what that warning language says. So I'm perfectly fine if it's, if we represent the general budget increase or the long-term whatever increase. Jake. I definitely agree that we have worked very hard on the budget. Um, and the thing that that always rocks my world um, this year is that um, if voters think it's they don't like the budget and they send it back to us and we knock off, you know, another half million dollars, it does nothing to their taxes. Yeah. You know, yeah. so wait, wading into this the the extra stuff. Um, you know, kind of creates that opening to me. Um, and then that part is super hard to explain. And that, that I think might rock their world too, because that's very different than how things normally work. And it's yes. very different than how things work for municipal taxes. So, um, so that's why I'm a little leery of extra information in that, in that section. And just to, just to add on to what Jake said, like I've run these scenarios, it would cost, I mean, it, it would, in order to change the tax rate, we would be cutting millions. Like we're not talking about a hundred thousand here, a hundred thousand there. We're talking yeah, millions. So um, 
I can hear what Jake's saying. I think, I think taking a guess as to how our communities will react to budget language when they vote is really hard. I, I mean, <laughs> it's really our human behavior. Given the light of what Jake said, I mean, would it be easier just to cut it off at the question mark and be transparent in other ways to put on an op-ed that puts out all the numbers, including the 19%, to put it on our budget page? Because I think trying to explain it in a small paragraph and the thing is, and I think what we've learned in the last half hour is it's gonna be very confusing. So maybe this year, because of the complexity, we buy transparent, we make sure it gets in the bridge, we make sure it gets in the Times Argus, we make sure it's on our webpage, we make sure we put it on you know social media and Other put all these numbers out. Letters too. Yeah. And you know, send writing send, letters. Yeah, write a to letter. Our power school. Yeah, to power oh, yeah. school, to our community. Yeah. Um and just be very transparent with all these numbers in the context. Be, I, I, I think that makes more sense because I think we either write a tome or we confuse people. <laughs> and I, I agree with that. There's like quite a story this year. Um, very difficult to convey it in just a couple sentences. And, and I think we should tell the whole story. Um, but in the article, I think we should keep it keep it simple. I have a process question. Okay. Since this is what's before us, drafted by Libby and Christina, and we need to vote tonight or hold some a special meeting to vote on it in time to get it to the our city clerks, how, if we were going to change this language, how do we propose doing that? We, we just I, make an amendment that we yeah, do it with amend the, it. the amended okay. language, yeah. yeah. Does it take a motion? There's, There's no motion on the table right now. There's no motion on the table right now. But you could make a motion. I approve the the budget, and you usually, I think we usually vote. You have to approve together. the budget, and then you have to approve, have to approve the, the article. So approve the budget, and then approve the motion with the suggested. Okay, I, I'm going to get the somewhat easy one out of the way. I move that we approve the FY25 budget. Do you have a second? A second. Do you have any discussion? Miriam. Sorry. Block us at eight sixteen, but um, I want to. We received a letter from the Montpelier High School Science Department that I think just bears mentioning about the cut from MHS Sustainability one more time. I I really am fully aware that difficult decisions need to be made, but I think it doesn't mean that we should not question proposed solutions, but consider them more seriously. The cut just doesn't to me fit with the rest of the really thoughtful value-driven plan that Libby and her team put together. It's a small cut. It wouldn't result in significant savings for the district. And it's likely gonna result in the loss of a full-time employee. Um, so I don't know if this is the time for further discussion, but I would regret it if I didn't mention that one more time that from a place of understanding the gravity of the decisions we're making, I'm really uncomfortable with that one. Um, for the discussion, any, yeah, thank you for raising that. Yeah, I think I, I, think I said my piece and I've lost track of how many meetings. <laughs> I agree, it does feel, it does um, feel really unfortunate, especially with so many moving pieces and parts. And I just, I appreciate the, the science folks reaching out to explain that to us. So I do still feel uncomfortable. I'm planning on supporting the budget um, because it doesn't seem like we can change this, but I hope every year we don't just continue to kind of death by a thousand cuts. And this did feel like it was a very small amount of money that would be a small impact on our overall budget, but would have a significant impact on um, an individual and a lot of students. So I do share Miriam's concern. Jill. Yeah. Uh, I uh, totally hear that. And I really appreciate the, the science department reaching out to us and offering um, some other solutions. As I read that, read their letter to us, um, it occurred to me that the the options they were presenting 
you know, whether or not to implement them don't live at the board level. Yes. They live at the level of our principal at the high school and our curriculum director and our superintendent. And so I the where I've landed is that we've established a budget that has the money we need to fund our schools for next year. And I would love for Libby and Mike and Jason to look at those ideas that the science department put forward and say, should we implement this kind of this, like these in, new ideas coming through from our science department? And if so, let's figure out how to make it work within this budget. So that's that's where I've landed, which is why I support the budget that we have established as far as these are the main dollar figures. Would those suggestions be implemented after the budget is passed or not? Like it would have to happen. Before. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Is, and, and Libby, you should correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm saying is we vote to say it's $32,046,114. Mm -hmm. That's the money that our administration has to spend on education. Then they go and decide like these are the, yeah. um, the this is the way we spend it. And I think that, you know, I, I really appreciate Libby sharing with us at that granular level of like, these are my ideas for what staffing cuts look like to give us the sense of like, what does this really mean? Because I think if we only saw them in vague terms, it would be even harder to make decisions. But now that we have established this is the money that we need and it results in um, this kind of a tax rate for um, citizens in our two towns, it makes sense to me that it's in the, you know, the administration of the high school and our central office team to determine how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll second that. The, in the, in yeah. The, um, categories. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, it was a very thoughtful letter and, and we definitely appreciate the feedback, but, um, these are very operational decisions and that, you know, the board, the board does not design the classes and, uh, you know, determine who teaches them. Can I take a moment to appreciate our student representatives? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. You've both been, been excellent. At the risk of being redundant, yeah, thanks Miriam for bringing it up again. Um, because you know it's it's not it's not gone away, and I kind of ha arrived at that too, just sort of like as an individual who is an environmental science, like I really appreciate the idea of more kind of hands-on participatory place-based science education. Absolutely, as a parent, I really appreciate that. And I also realize as a board member, there's a point at which, you know, we walk up against a line and don't make those just those decisions. And, you know, should miracles happen, you know, at the legislative level, and there is some trickle down or some money winds up being in the budget, I would definitely support, you know, that being, um, being looked at again. You know, I'm also remembering as a board, you know, we approved our net zero resolution where we did say in that resolution that we were um, wanted to support opportunities in environmental literacy in you know, participatory science and so on and so forth. So this board has also in the past said that, you know, we certainly support these things and yet we don't make those kind of granular decisions. But I would hope if there's an opportunity, some miracle money comes to the fore that the administration would kind of look at those decisions again. Um, around that role, because I do share your concern that if you knock uh, an already part-time position down that much more, do you lose a person altogether? That's very real. So, thank you. Um, other questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Do we need to hear from, do, do they need to voice vote? Or, I don't know. Any opposed? And do you both voted? Both voted A, I. Thumbs yes. up, I, A. I, A. <laughs> okay, I will also register a vote as I. Um, so I think it's an important budget and I want to be on the record. Um, thank you, everyone. This is a very tough budget season and I really appreciate the hard work. Uh, it has not been easy. I'm not done yet. All right, well, just making sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate the hard work. This was this was not an easy budget season. Um, and yeah, there were a lot of factors. In fact, most of the factors were out of our control. And I think we did the best job we could. And, and um, everyone put in a ton of work, not only just making hard decisions, but understanding a completely Byzantine um, situation that um, 
was just just very hard to navigate. Uh, so appreciate all the time, including the extra meetings and the extra hours. Um, so thank you. Uh, now on to the article. Um, do I have a motion to approve the article either as is or with discussed amendments? I think it's confusing with the second and third sentence in there. Do you want to make a motion to approve it with those sentences? <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you want to make a motion to approve the article with those two sentences stricken? Yep. I'll I'll make motion that we approve article uh, three with only about the whole thing. The whole the warning. Yeah. The warning. Yes. With changes to article three um, to eliminate everything after the first sentence. Do I have a second? I'll I'll second. second requested by the school board, but Time for discussion. Uh, we need a second. No, we, so we, yeah. we got yeah, three heard, of them. Yeah, oh, did we? I heard lots of seconds. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so this would mean that we're not also including the sentence that says it represents an increase of 12% from FY24. Yes. We're just going with the one sentence. Yes, with the idea that we will explain the full context in multiple public forums. Okay. I'm open for an amendment. Amendment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my 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 reason, as I explained earlier, I just think I think it's really hard to put in a few numbers in such a short place and have it make sense to anyone. I mean, I, I think it's one of those things where um, a part of the story is is gonna is gonna be warped. But I think I think we, we owe it to the community to explain the whole story in as many places as we can. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, discussions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I too. Um, I think we've got up again, but uh, I think we've got a policy thing on the Bob. I'll move that we accept the policy monitoring report for C4 limited English proficiency students. Second. Any discussion or questions? See you, Ryan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Nay? No, not opposed. Uh, I'm, that was on nay. That was just a nay. <laughs> you're, not voting, not you're not voting against I'm, that. Okay. I'm not voting against Double it. checking. Uh, do you have a motion to adjourn? So the uh, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Good